Welcome everybody. I'm glad that you were able to join us today on this session about trans programming at AIDS 2020 and in the history of the IAS conferences. It's just a few days for the AIDS conferences and we're all excited to present to you what you can expect, what you will be able to experience in this AIDS 2020 virtual. And we have a great panel today with us. I will let each panel introduce themselves so you can get to know them and you'll learn a little bit about their role, their work, what are their passions in life, what they're doing and how they are surviving this pandemic and these cir current circumstances. So let's start with the gentleman in the room, Max. Hello everyone. Um, thanks for giving me the floor first. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Max and I'm the project coordinator for the trans men and HIV working group for GATE. Um, I will not tell you too much of my work with GATE right now because like, I'm going to give you a proper introduction um, in a few minutes of what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing and what specifically we're going to be doing um, during AIDS 2020, which I'm really excited about and yeah. Uh, if I'm not working for GATE, I'm also a PhD student in public health and trying to somehow get my doctor title <laughs> like in, the, in this current situation. So it's, it's a bit harder um, than usual, but I'm just trying to do a lot of self-care at the moment. Like I eat a lot, I cook a lot, and basically my life is turning around food at the moment. So um, yeah, that's it. And thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Max. Uh, Michelle. Ah, well, I'm um, Michelle Ross, and um, I'm the founder of Clinic U, which is this. It's um, an holistic well-being and sexual health service by trans people for trans people. And that's really important part of this, because we were the first in the UK. And since that, over nine years, other services developed similar, but not quite the same. And, um, and it's all developing, so that's really great. Um, I live in London. Um, I'm a psychotherapist. I've been involved with HIV for 32 years, mainly as a psychotherapist. And um, so a lot of my work is focused on that, although I'm also focused on trans people um, in terms of HIV. And as you mentioned <clears throat> um, earlier, or someone mentioned, you know, trans people were not actually that included in HIV response. I'm also um, in, on the board with Joanne Keatley, at IRGT and also um, I love gardening and I grow lots of vegetables and there's someone here who does something similar and I just love that connection so that's me. Thank you very much Michelle and Joanne please tell us great, who you are. Okay great thank you Erica well I'm Joanne Keatley and um, I'm the chair of the board of the IRGT, Innovative Response Globally for Trans Women and HIV. And I'm the former, well, the founding director and co-principal investigator at the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health at the University of California, San Francisco, um, which I had the pleasure, the distinct pleasure of retiring from the university a few years ago. One of, I think, one of the few people in the world to actually retire from a job with a pension. <laughs> but um, I, uh, at the, at both at the university and at the IRGT, um, I had, uh, you know, the opportunity really to advance uh, transgender health and transgender uh, issues surrounding the HIV epidemic. And, um, and the ability to respond to the HIV epidemic from a uh, from a very specific trans uh, perspective. So um, let's see. In terms of my personal life, uh, I won't talk to you about my passions, although I'm passionate about everything I do. So maybe I will talk to you about my passion. But um, you know, I was born in Mexico. I was originally from uh, La Ciudad de Mexico, and I came to the United States as an undocumented little, you know, child, um, and, you know, went through lots of struggles in terms of, um, you know, being an immigrant, being a poor immigrant, and being an immigrant without documentation. Um, and then, you know, transitioning and, uh, 
you know, transitioning in a family that didn't really understand uh, what I was going through. So, um, and then, you know, ending up out on the street when I was 13 years old um, and surviving uh, by my wits and by luck, uh, I, you know, and, and by the, um, you know, people who, who took mercy on me and, and took me under their wings. So um, I draw from, you know, both my personal experience and my academic training for all the work that I do. And I like to think back about where I came from whenever I'm doing the work that I'm doing. So that's a little bit about me. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joanne. And I think you're touching something very important that a lot of trans people all over the world identify to the fact that many of us, there's, we survive. And you know that, that, you know, the theme for the AIDS conference this year is resiliency. And I don't think there are more resilient people in this world than trans people. Forgive me if, if you think different, but that's a fact. <laughs> that's right. I totally and, agree with you, sister. Yes, that, <laughs> definitely. And that's not fake news, okay? That is not no, fake news. No. You and can take we that are, to the I, bank. <laughs> and you know, one the thing that we need to do is to move from that survival mode until we achieve thriving. We need to thrive. We need to be human beings that try, that have rights, that we don't have to be worrying about fighting for, for rights here or to be able to access work or to be able to have a plate of food every day. That is what we want to achieve. And I think that's what all these panelists here have in common. So yes. to tell you about myself, I'm Erika Castellanos. I'm director of programs at GATE. I am originally from Belize, residing in the Netherlands right now. I moved to the Netherlands because of love, the best reason to move anywhere in the world. So <laughs> I also love gardening like Michelle, and I have enjoyed it, uh, the time in my garden. So I, I, I love my work. I love what I do, and I'm glad to have you here today. So a few house um, information for all of you. Uh, there will be question and answers. There's going to be opportunity for the attendees to ask question and answer. There is a question and answer uh, chat where you can post your questions. We will have all the panelists do their presentations, take us through their presentation, and afterwards we will open to question and answers. But if you have a question, you can put it in the chat one time. If you prefer to express uh, yourself uh, asking the question, please, uh, you can indicate it in the chat also, and our um, uh, communication officer from GATE, uh, who works behind the scenes to make everything happen, uh, will kindly try to enable your microphone. So, although I know Navon wants to always be behind the scenes, I want to big up Navon and say thank you for making sure that we are here on time, we get the information, and that we can reach to you. So, with further ado, we're going to start. So, today we have an exciting session. We want to share with you what you will see in AIDS 2020, what you can expect, but also we want you to reflect how we have gotten here. Many times we complain about the little access in uh, AIDS conferences, but believe me, if you compare it to 10 years ago, this is already huge access. So we want to reflect on that. And Joanne is going to be the person that takes you, you know, through a snapshot of how trans activism has looked and how trans participation has looked around the history of AIDS conferences and how trans visibility has improved. So, Joanne. What I'm going to share with you today is really um, a history of um, some of the organized activities that we've engaged in at the International AIDS Conferences. Um, but also, I want to begin prior to the organized activities and give you a snapshot of what uh, participation at International AIDS Conferences used to be like for trans people before there were organized activities. And so, I want to start us off actually in the year um, 2000, um, I think it was 2000, in Barcelona, when um, the NIH actually, the National Institute of Health of um, the US you know, government, um, supported a, a satellite session at the International AIDS Conference in Barcelona. 
And that was the first satellite session that was specific to trans people. Um, and so that's meaningful because that was just 20 years ago um, that, uh, you know, 15 years into the epidemic, um, you know, there was finally something to do with trans people at an international AIDS conference. The history of the, those conferences had been that trans uh, issues, whether you were trans men, trans women, or you know, non-binary language that we're using today, um, but whether, whatever, wherever you were on the spectrum in terms of trans identities, um, you were collapsed into MSM activities at the International AIDS Conferences. And so sessions that included either trans content or data that was about trans people or um, you know, action um, or a political advocacy uh, that uh, trans people wanted to get behind. It had to be in the context of men who have said sex with men uh, sessions and zones and satellites and other kinds of activities. Um, so it was really from you know, my perspective uh, and I think from many um, other trans activists who attended that conference, it was really apparent to us that we're, we were being invisibilized and that, um, that there wasn't a place for us uh, at the time. Now things started changing from then on and uh, there were increased uh, presence of trans people. I remember in Barcelona, there was probably a total of 20, 25 people in attendance who identified as trans. It was really a very small, uh, you know, cohort of, of people back then that attended. Um, but then in subsequent uh, conferences, there were every year or every other year when the conferences would take place, there would be, a, you know, a few more trans people would um, start participating. And of course, the challenges were that, um, you know, the way that uh, trans people can participate at international AIDS conferences typically is that um, you know you um, you present uh, a request for scholarship or you are working in a project that um, you know is working with the community and the project that you're working for pays your registration and so lots of trans people back then did not have employment they weren't working in jobs that would actually then pay for very high cost registration and then paid your travel costs to attend these conferences. So really, you know, we were left, getting left out. Um, so I'm, now I'm gonna, you know, that was in the beginning, I'm gonna say. <laughs> and we went through, a, you know, a decade of that. Um, and then in Mexico City in 2008, um, there were a few trans people that got together and we did, um, a kind of a community focus group. And um, there was, um, you know, what ended up becoming IRGT, but also um, GATE uh, individuals were in attendance then, and, um, and other trans activists from around the globe. And we got together, we sat down, and we spoke about the issues that were impacting us, and, um, you know, and tried to kind of come up with a way forward. Um, and it took us a few years, but um, get together, we did. And uh, then we started um, developing what ended up becoming organized activities. So now I'll switch over to IRGT. So IRGT, the um, Innovative Response Globally for Trans Women and HIV, our vision is a world of vibrant, healthy, and empowered trans women. And our mission is to advocate for trans issues in the international HIV response while promoting trans women's health and human rights. And our board members represent uh, individuals from around the globe. These are um, our board members. I won't, you know, read them out loud, but you know, you can see for yourself here who are advising the organization. Um, and 
the IRGT was launched in 2010. Um, in, in the beginning, like I said, a lot of the activities that, um, that uh, trans people um, had the opportunity to participate in were in the context of um, you know, MSM. And IRGT was no different. It was launched in 2010 as a reference group with support initially from MPAC, formerly the MSMGF. Um, and we became a global network of trans women focused on HIV. Um, we had board members on every continent, and we were recognized by the World Health Organization, the Global Fund, the International AIDS Society, PEPFAR, USA, the UN bodies, as one of the thought leaders on trans people and HIV. Not, certainly not the only one, but one of the thought leaders. And um, we, um, in 2014, Actually, in 2012, um, the impact supported us, and we had um, a kind of quasi um, space presence in Vienna in 2012. Um, and we did have a number of trans people that we were able to support to participate there, but not in the context of our own standalone event. Now, in 2014, uh, working with GATE and with the Asia Pacific Transgender Network and with Red Trans um, Peru and Red Electrons and other organizations from around the globe, um, we were able to organize the first trans Pacific networking zone at an international AIDS conference in 2014. And we called it Trans People Step Forward. And this was uh, the result. You can see here, the programming that uh, we delivered. Uh, and it was very exciting because it was the first time in the history of the International AIDS Conference. And you can see it's a very short six years ago, 2014, that we actually had, you know, multiple days of programming at, uh, at one of the International AIDS Conferences. And we had a number of trans people that we were able to um, provide support for attending. And, um, you know, and we tried to address issues that were impacting uh, the global community. So that was the very first in the history of the International AIDS Conference. And then um, these are just, you know, some of the images from, um, from that conference of uh, different uh, trans, uh, you know, people participating in some of the sessions and in uh, the space that we created um, for the networking zone. Um, just showing some of the diversity present. Um, I should say that picture that I just showed, um, while I love the, you know, I love the, the, um, indigenous um, clothing and uh, you know the, the image is, is a very beautiful image I think but I think it also reflects one of the uh, spaces that we were delegated to and that in the global village there were uh, there was always space in the stages for trans people to perform art uh, whether it was indigenous art or uh, you know, drag performances or whatever, but very uh, few opportunities to present serious work that we were engaged in. So, you know, while I love that image, it does reflect like the role that we were delegated to often. Anyway, in 2016, um, because, you know, we were living in a very different uh, economic time and a very different political time, um, we had uh, and because we had done an effective job of increasing awareness of the issues that were impacting trans people globally, uh, we had the opportunity and the support from, um, you know, uh, global bodies that were involved in the AIDS response uh, who stepped up and supported our ability to deliver the first ever trans pre-conference at the International AIDS Conference. And so we organized No More Lip Service, which is, you know, what the name that we came up with. 
and our tagline was trans access, equity, and rights now. Um, it was the trans pre-conference uh, in Durban, in South Africa, and it happened to be on my birthday, July the 17th, <laughs> 2016. So um, it was, you know, uh, really for me, it was just a lovely um, opportunity to celebrate not only my birthday, but also, you know, the, um, the ability to bring information for so many people um, in the global response for HIV among trans people. Um, we had almost 400 people in attendance, uh, many people uh, from uh, global bodies, including, uh, you know, U.S. government representatives, but also UNAIDS and uh, WHO. Um, and uh, it was, as I said, the first ever trans-specific pre-conference. And then we also had a trans networking zone from uh, the 18th to the 22nd which was really well attended. It was actually one of the, you know, from everything that we heard, it was one of the highlights of the conference itself. And this is, you can see here um, where we had um, our networking zone and the kind of attendance that was in the networking zone. It was just a beautiful thing to see, um, we felt. Um, you, you can see at that point, it was, you know, pretty much standing room only in the networking zone most of the time that we were uh, operating it. And uh, the other picture there is of me and, um, and Rita Sarkar, who is uh, on the um, board of IRGT and one of the executive committee members. Yeah. Then um, in 2018, we had uh, the opportunity to partner yet again with uh, the global community uh, our, our colleagues and partners in arms, uh, GATE and APTN and Redlock, um, Peru, um, and other organizations, um, you know, Clinic U. Um, and we uh, put together Transaction, which was uh, Building Bridges to Safety, and that was our uh, pre conference. Um, and uh, that was in Amsterdam. And then we had. I'm sorry, the transaction building bridges to safety was, um, was the pre-conference. And then we had the trans networking zone um, from July the 23rd till the 27th. And this, um, the bridging the trans divide, um, that was the networking zone. Um, we had, uh, you know, a, we were actually relegated to a very small networking zone. We were not happy about that. But, um, but nevertheless, we were still, um, you know, very well attended, lots of uh, opportunities for collaboration. We had sessions that, um, you know, covered uh, the global issues impacting our community. And these are some images from, from that networking zone. I just wanted to share with you just a couple of policy briefs that I think would, you know, be of interest to you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but, you know, one of the things that we've developed was the most impacted least served. You can find that on our website at IRGT.org. Um, also, we've developed a policy brief called Counting Trans People In, which is also available on our website at IRGT.org. And, um, you know, this is a special issue that um, we were involved in both, uh, actually, um, you know, GATE and IRGT were involved in uh, HIV epidemics among transgender populations, the importance of a trans inclusive response. And I think that's something that's worth uh, spending some time reviewing. Um, and then this is an example of a, a, a WHO policy issue transgender people in HIV that um, IRGT had a role in developing. Um, and I think, you know, it tells the perspective from a, from a trans, um, you know, perspective of the issues that are impacting us. And this is my rascal, the love of my life at this time. <laughs> um, you know, always happy to see me and I'm always happy to see him. So, um, I think that's all I have for you right now. I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. And my contact information is there in front of you.
Thank you very much, John. I want to remind people that uh, if you have any questions uh, directed to Joanne, you can start placing them in the Q&A uh, chat uh, function. Also, uh, you can let us know if you want to ask the question directly and our support uh, communications officer, Navon O'Connor, will be able to um, hopefully activate your microphone and you can ask your questions. Um, we're gonna have the question and answer session at the end. So please don't hesitate uh, to put your questions and answer. We're gonna move quickly um, to Max, who's gonna uh, introduce us to um, the satellite session and the work of the International HIV and uh, Trans Men and HIV Working Group has been doing and what they have prepared for AIDS 2020 virtual. Max, please go ahead. I'm the project coordinator of the Trans Men and HIV Working Group with GATE. And I'll just give you like a much shorter <laughs> historic overview because there's not as much to tell about as, as there is about uh, what, what Joanne just shared with you. And basically, um, like the first actions that were taken um, specifically at, uh, at the AIDS conferences was in Durban in 2016, when a group of trans men also came together and actually like um, wrote the Durban statement, which was basically to call out on, hey, we're here, we exist as well. And like, we have been neglected, like, the whole whole time so if i talk about trans men um like our group not only includes trans men but also like other female assigned at birth trans people who do identify also somewhere outside of of the male spectrum and um basically in 2018 in amsterdam at the at the aids conference there was the first time that we actually held a group meeting and um this was already like getting there, getting to take this photo, getting to have this, this, this meeting was super problematic because like we were looking for a space. Like we knocked on like, I don't know how many booths and we're like, hey, listen, we would like to have like an hour, an hour and a half to meet and to use your space. Is that possible? Because like everyone had like a really, really tight schedule and it was like at the end, like, I mean, we were lucky, but that already was a bit of where we were like, hey, so like, give us some space like we're here and like we have this initiative and we want to start something and what actually developed out of that first initial meeting um was that in april 2019 the trans men and hiv working group was was formally found by gate and today which i'm super proud of we actually have 21 active members like people who regularly engage with the group from 17 different countries. And also like the distribution of countries, it is completely like we really, we're really covering the entire globe, all continents. And that makes me really proud. And I'm really grateful for everyone who is participating in this group and is putting their time. Like it's all volunteer work of the participants. Um, and we come together uh, for a monthly phone call. And like, even now we call, even like the calls are, are a bit more often because we're planning actions. We're planning actions to increase visibility specifically for the AIDS 2020 conference. And, um, but like, let me just quickly go back into the timeline. What happened last year uh, at the International AIDS Society Conference in Mexico City was that there was also a trans-led intervention where a lot of trans guys who are part of the group participated in to call out people on a panel of like, listen, this, what, what's happening here right now is not really trans inclusive. It is really problematic. And what developed out of that intervention was that the, um, the editor of um, the Lancet HIV came up to us and was like, listen, can you please write something about what just happened? Um, and we got the chance to publish a comment in the Lancet HIV, in which also like a few of the, the people from the working group and other people, for example, also Joanne participated in um, to, to make clear like that, that there are certain structures and a lot of problematic ways of how trans people are being dealt with in these conferences. And um, that was like an initial step to also get it beyond like the conference room to get it out into like the, the world of researchers and, uh, and other public health experts and activists to be like, listen, something, something is happening and we, we, we won't shut up. Like we will, we will make ourselves 
our voices being heard and um, yeah. What we do this year at the, at the AIDS 2020 conference is that there will be a specific satellite session on, we call it transgender men and HIV experiences and vulnerabilities, why we should care and where to go from here. In this um, session, uh, we actually like, we have, we have a panel of um, nine group members also from very various different countries and regions that actually like we share with you our experience like what what's happening like why why it is so important to include us in the work around hiv prevention and care and um what the issues are with accessing healthcare services and we did something similar in may 2020 this year already through a facebook live event which was hosted by unaids where uh, myself and three other group members um, talked about sexual health needs and vulnerabilities of trans men specifically. And this is like, you know, like little by little, we're getting the message out and we're like, we need support of getting like some sort of a platform where people actually listen to what we have to say because it is important and is important for us, like for our survival and to have actually our healthcare needs met. And if you're interested in the, um, in, in the satellite session for the conference. Um, it's happening on July the 9th on like it's a Thursday during the conference. Um, I cannot see the time myself because like the like it's 6 a.m. San Francisco time, I think uh, 10 a.m. Buenos Aires, uh, 3 p.m. Amsterdam, um, 6.30 New Delhi, 9 p.m. Singapore and 11 p.m. in Sydney. So um, why is it so important to talk about uh, the needs of trans men in HIV research and prevention? If you look at what's been going on in terms of inclusion of trans people, we are a completely understudied population and we have been systematically excluded from research um, trials. And there has been one study looking at um, like the time frame of like 2012 to 2015 and there were 32 studies about trans women and HIV, only five studies actually in were inclusive of trans men in the same period and non talked about non-binary identities. And the issue is, you know, there's a lot of stereotypical assumptions of how and with whom trans men have sex. And that actually needs to neglect of ad adequate prevention and care. Like it's always the stereotypical assumption that um, trans men like may have only sex with cisgender women, but that's not true. You know, there's, there's a lot of trans guys identifying as gay or having sex with other trans women. So it's like um, something that, that need, like people need to open up their minds of um, and, and get away with like stereotypical ideas. And also looking at um, the fact that around um, half of trans men and three in five non-binary people assigned female at birth are actually survivors of sexual violence which puts us at risk as well. We're also like some of us identify as sex workers and some of us also use alcohol and drugs or like other, other substances also in relation to sex. So this is like the, the fact that like people need to start care more. And I brought one example from one specific study that actually showed um, what's the problem with like, for example, trans men accessing PrEP, like the pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent an infection with HIV. There was a study, a like recent study found that almost a quarter of the participants um, like uh, fulfilled the CDC criteria for PrEP eligibility. That means there's certain criteria that say, okay, if a person has like this and like um, either, for example, sex worker or identifies as MSM, or there's a couple of other criteria, um, those people should be given information about PrEP and if they want also prescription about PrEP. So if you look at the study participants, the ones who were eligible, it was around 420 participants. Um, out of these 420, um, about 82% saw a healthcare provider a year prior to the study. Of them, only 65, almost 65% were tested for HIV. Only one third of them who were tested for HIV were actually given information about PrEP. And only 32 of them who had, given, had been given information were actually like received a prep uh, a prescription for prep and looking back at the 420 like from where we started at with the ones who fulfilled the criteria only 11 almost 11 percent were actually ending up taking prep so you see where the cascade is going down with like problems of where to get information and where to get like appropriate care um for us like for for, for protecting ourselves 
And the goals of our group um, and what we also try to achieve with the satellite session to get it to a bigger audience, a wider audience, is basically to combat, combat this persistent exclusion of trans men from the global HIV response. To make ourselves, like to say it loud and clear that we are here and as I said, like we won't go anywhere until people are listening to us. We want to generate and strengthen knowledge about specific, specific needs and diverse vulnerabilities that we have and also to develop strategies to increase the meaning, meaningful inclusion of trans people in health discussions in general. And I really want to like make sure that um, I don't want to like us the group and me also personally, I don't want to take away any space or funding or whatever from trans women organizations or initiatives. Like there needs to happen more for the entire community. It's not either trans men or trans women or non-binary people. Like, it needs to be an understanding that every one of us needs to be cared for. And, um, you know, like with this also to make like some, some positive changes in awareness about the realities of trans people in general, like what we are dealing with globally, with um, like, the, like what, what our needs are in, in regard to HIV prevention and also like uh, in, in HIV care. And um, yeah, I think for now that's it. And thank you everyone for listening to me. Thank you very much. Once again, I want to remind everybody if you have questions for Joanne, for Max, please put them on the Q&A function. Uh, that was very interesting, Max, and particularly that cascade. It's, it's a very, very, very bad cascade. You know, when we're talking about HIV cascade, we're talking about the 1990-90, and I will ask something about the 490 to all of you afterwards, but that is a horrible cascade when we're talking about the access of PrEP and accesses to prevention tools to trans masculine people. Uh, and now we're gonna go to Michelle. Michelle is gonna be talking to us about the activities in the trans networking zone. This is the first time we're having a virtual trans networking zone. And this time we were gonna have a bigger one but unfortunately we cannot be there in person, but this is just the meanwhile. We're gonna meet in person very soon. So Michelle, please go ahead. I'm going to be talking about the content of um, the trans networking zone, the virtual trans networking zone. And actually I must say, and thank you for Joanne for, you know, how the networking zone came about. I think it was massively important that you know, trans people had a presence within the main conference. But I just love the networking zone, the physical, when we're there in, 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 you know, the ones that I've been to and been involved with. I think there's something really special about those. And that's reflected in what I'm going to talk about today. You know, this is by trans people for trans people. And the content, when I read it all, it's just blown me away in a way. So it's thriving in eye diversity, the trans networking zone. And as you can say, um, IRGT, Gate and Clinic Q <coughs> um, have, some in, have been involved in this. So if you can go to the next slide where I talk about the programming. <coughs> and I was so pleased to hear Mark so, speak so uh, extensively and passionately about trans men and HIV. And I fully 100% support all that you said, Max. And it's, you know, it's, it's not about trans women, it's not about trans men, it's about us all getting an equal funding. So look at this, um, Trans Men and Sexual Health Global Webinar, which is, this is split into three videos, and I, I don't know too much about that, but I, you know, in the question and answers, we can all respond to this uh, uh, when they come about. So Trans Men and HIV panel, um, and HIV experiences and, and vulnerabilities of, of trans people, trans men. And I know in the UK, there's very few people, trans men and trans women, visible in terms of living with HIV because of the stigma that's involved. <clears throat> and, and as you can see, I won't read them all out on every slide, but just to focus on this, because I don't think it gives enough space, as Max has said. And how do sex as, as a transgender guy, uh, how do you have sex as a transgender guy by my generation? Um, I'm not sure if that's a film, but it's, it's a really important aspect of all that we're talking about. If you can go to the next slide, please. Okay. So there's um, healthcare and well-being. 
um, you know, it's what's important about this is, you know, um, the healthcare of trans people is all aspects of healthcare. We don't have a trans elbow. If I have something with, wrong with my elbow, it's not a trans elbow. I have something wrong with my elbow. So it's really important that holistic well-being is looked at. So our well-being around counselling and, and post-medical transition thoughts by Alex White, who's made a wonderful video on that, and PrEP. PrEP works. And uh, there's a lovely presentation by Prepster, trans men, trans people talking about uh, PrEP. And I'm passionate about PrEP. I'm on the, um, the advisory board in the UK for PrEP. Um, so taking PrEP, you know, what's it like as a trans person to be taking PrEP? What are your concerns and um, what works well? And I just love ACON, you know, in, in Sydney, South, South, um, South, South Wales in Sydney. Healthcare experience by ACON, Trans Hub and Talks, and gender euphoria. You know, you often hear dysphoria, but gender euphoria is, you know, um, by ACON and Trans Hub Talks. Um, I know I'm reading through this quite quickly, but there's quite a bit to go through. And if we go to the next slide. So if anybody watching this and hearing, please um, make any notes about any aspects of what, we're talk what I'm talking about now that you can bring to the Q&A um, or, or write it, text in on the chat. So um, global trans movements, just reading that brings a smile to my face because in a way I got involved in the global trans movement because of Joanne Keatley really. Um, and trans women in leadership panel. I'm so excited just to see that. Um, I've not seen it yet. But um, also, you know, the um, Middle East and North Africa region, um, which I'm afraid we don't hear enough of, really. We need to hear more about that. And Translatina, a community in the USA, um, a history of trans sex work in Mexico City, uh, a big open closet, trans in Russia by my generation. You know, we've heard a lot about the, the stuff that's happening in Russia around trans and queer people, you know, so I'm, I'm really keen to see that. Obviously, I'm going to be seeing it all. The Gates program um, projects presentation. I'm not sure about that one, but, you know, Gates does fantastic programs um, around all these things. The World AIDS Day playlist by Gate. Trans Day of Remembrance. You know, that holds a lot of special place in my heart around the Trans Day Remembrance, and that's by TGEU. Transforming Europe playlist by TGEU. Pro Trans Project playlist, again by TGEU. They have a big presence here. And, you know, TGEU, Transgender Europe, um, covers many countries in Europe. An International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers. Every day I see some sex worker who is trans on the media being murdered or, or, you know, physically beaten because they're a sex worker and because they're trans. Okay, can we go to the next slide? <clears throat> so we've also got entertainment, we haven't forgotten that. So um, there's some great performances. There's one by Lox Blacks who um, built my mother's effing moment. And um, <clears throat> another performance, coming out and welcoming you in. Often we talk about coming out to others, but we welcome you in. Um, International Mr. Leather winning speech by Jack Thompson. Wow, there's so much here. It's incredible. And I'm, I'm rushing through it, but I want to leave time so that everyone's got their questions and answered, uh, responded to. Um, okay. So then documentaries and short films. My Generation uh, playlist include trans kids, um, trans kids living trans and uh, growing older as me. You know, as someone who's growing older as a trans person, I'm keen to see what that means. And I think we don't focus enough on older trans people. My Generation short films include uh, things that make us 
get off my turf, watch me exist. We dig, trans femmes, I'm transgender and I love my trans body. Um, and cooking. Now, I love vegan food. <laughs> I can see Max uh, moving there because I, I know that Max has got an in, a big input on this. There we go, queer cuisine. <laughs> Fabulous. Vegan cooking and trans education by queer cuisine. Well, I want that and I can't wait. Thank you. So if you go to the, okay. So there are downloadable resources. So all this is going to be on film as well. So people will be able to see it at different times around the globe. Um, and I think, you know, it, that will be posted at different times as well. So guidelines for integration, the trans communities, the global fund processes. Trans men, an HIV working uh, group overview. Transit, the smart guide. You know, the transit was a fantastic document, uh, but it, it, it's been condensed and I'm not sure how much that has for implementation comprehensive HIV and STI programs with, trans, with transgender people. Trans education plus action equals capacity for health. Teach, train as manual, the state of trans organizing funding overview. You know, with, with all that's been happening with COVID and lockdown, a lot of funding has been taken away from a lot of vulnerable um, LGBT organizations and especially trans. I think sometimes that's the first thing to be either taken away or not included. I think I might be saying too much of my own stuff here, but so um, I kind of wish to do that, but um, we're gonna talk about some of that now uh, in terms of, um, ah, fantastic live chat. I uh, nearly forgot about this. Um, the 6th to the 10th of July, and that's when this program all starts, really. Um, and as you can see there, it's different times throughout. Um, so, you know, this will be available on the video because well, this is being recorded, and you can see it's different times throughout the um, world. Okay, is that the last of it? I think. Ah, there you go. So don't forget, um, you can see the link there. And thank you for more information. You can get that. Okay. Thank you very much, Michelle, for running us down through that amount, huge amount of programming that will be available in the Trans Networking Zone at AIDS 2020. Just remember that uh, uh, the Global Village, this will be located in the Global Village, and the Global Village is open access to the public it's completely free everybody can enter without having to pay a single cent and we will have all this programming available for you to access at any time at your convenience at your own pace uh, educational videos panels presentations short films cooking shows videos and of course we're gonna have every day at least one hour of live chat where you can interact with the panelists ask direct questions make recommendations and just chat with each other um like uh, michelle was saying you know one of the most beautiful things in the uh, is conferences is the networking zone to be able to sit down with each other and chat and converse and make plans to change and conquer the world so with that you know i'm gonna give it to the last pa last uh, presentation today we have max again with us who is gonna present to us about you know something new that we hadn't done in any conference before gate hadn't done and we're gonna have an ngo booth uh so max tell us what will be there for people to see What's happening now is that I'm just going to give you a brief, like a short information about the NGO booth. This is basically, we just want to take more space. Like either physically we would have done that also like uh, now virtually that we just like, we got the chance we have to have another booth specifically for the work about gate. Like what do we do? Like to give you more information about what, what um, all the different fields of, uh, of, of our expertise or our work are. And um, the, there's also going to be a daily chat, also like here the information about the times, different time zones, um, and we will be there for at least one hour each day during the conference from the 6th 
to the 10th of July. And you can also additionally download some resources about uh, the work that we're doing. There is a few um, like uh, PDF documents that can be downloaded, but also some videos that we took, like for example, like a video from all staff members of GATE um, in which we explain to you what we are doing, what our specific field are um, and the projects that we're working on. And yeah, so I invite you to also check out again, like I think it can't be said enough, like Michelle already said, like check out the website, um, gate.ngo slash AIDS 2020 to find like all the information where, they, where there's also going to be a calendar with all the trend specific um, uh, presentations and everything that is happening during AIDS 2020. And um, if you don't know how to get access to the global village or to find the NGO booth or whatever going on, please check out Gates YouTube channel um, where, the, where you can find information like videos that guide you through how to find things during the conference. It's going to be like for me, I, I'm not the most techie person. Um, and specifically with this all virtual stuff, sometimes I, I, I really get lost and then I get frustrated and I don't know and then I'm going to leave. No, you don't have to do that. You can check out the video first or if you, if you can figure it out, check out the video um, and you get some information how to access all these different spaces. Also for updates and whatever is going on, we will be really active, thanks to Naven, on social media. So um, if you don't already follow us on Twitter or Facebook, um, please check us, check out what we are doing and you'll get all the latest information about what's happening during AIDS 2020. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you very much for taking us what people can find there. There is a comment. Uh, so Tebogo is uh, saying, great presentation, colleagues. Very excited to see more trans men specific work. I think it's very important to start listening to trans men experiences and needs. I hope we will have opportunity to learn from trans women good practices. Any reflections from any of you on this comment? Also, uh, for the attendees, you can uh, raise your hand so that your microphone is enabled and you can ask the questions or make your comments or you can post it in the chat. I mean, like to Debogo's comment, as I said during the presentation, it is super important to not like start a division between like the different uh, members of the communities. And it is so important, you know, like I don't want to take away any space from trans women. I don't want to stand in front of them or anything. Like I just like ask them, to move a step to the left or to the right so I can just squeeze in and that together we just take more space, you know, like this is something that we need to do as a community together and also for funders and donors to understand that, they, that it's not only trans women or only trans men or only non-binary people, however people identify. It is like we are a community and it is important to, to look out for all of us. Thank you very much. Grand Mike is muted. Joanne, you're muted. You're muted. No. How do I unmute myself? Yeah. You are unmuted now. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to say I, it, it, I'm so thrilled that Tobago is on uh, and, you know, sharing his thoughts on, um, you know, what we spoke about today. Um, it's, it's lovely to hear from people that I've seen in the movement and, you know, uh, continue to grow, continue to expand space. And I'm just thrilled that we're doing this together um, as a global community. So more power um, to the participants that were on uh, with us. And I'm thrilled to see where we can, you know, what heights we can reach and how far this movement can continue to grow. Thank you very much. Remember, you can raise your hand if you want to ask something directly or post it in the Q&A. Joanne, you took us through a history of what has the response look and the participation of trans people in the different AIDS conferences, from being included in MSM programming to finally having own programming, networking zone, uh, we saw pre-conferences. Can you tell us a little bit about what the main challenges were to have those spaces, to own those spaces, and mm -hmm. how the movement overcame them? Well, I don't know that we've overcome them. I think we're, you know, we're in the process of overcoming them. Like Max 
you know, shared, there's still a lot of invisibility within our community. And so we are in the process of overcoming the barriers. Um, I think that the barriers that we faced starting, you know, 20 years ago when we were so challenged to create space on our own or for ourselves is really around, um, you know, the lack of awareness, transphobia, you know, uh, systematic transphobia, um, I think was alive and well 20 years ago, like it is alive and well today. And, um, and really the refusal of, um, you know, <laughs> what I call the HIV industry to move aside and to uh, allow for you know, different populations that were at risk for HIV from the beginning, but, you know, refusing to let us carve space on our own terms, by us, for us. Um, and I think that that is, that was the, the greatest barrier in my mind, is the refusal to understand. And, you know, when I say refusal, I mean refusal, because it wasn't just a matter of um, explaining to people the differences, uh, you know, among trans um, individuals and other communities at risk for HIV, other key populations. It wasn't just a matter of explaining the differences. It was really, you know, people refusing to hear that there were distinctions, that there were differences, that there were different needs, and that there needed to be a, a specific response. And um, it, was, it was not convenient for the HIV industry um, because people carve out, you know, niches of their own and then they're protected of those niches. And so I think the struggle that Max uh, spoke about and shared with us is a struggle that we've been going through over the last 20 years. And, you know, I'm really hopeful that we'll get to a place where we get past the struggle and that you know, we level the playing field and that we have in sufficient resources to respond to the needs of all of our community, not just some of us. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Um, I love your words, Joanne. And, um, you know, that when you mention bios for us, you know, those are really important weighted valued words. And I know sometimes they're seen as a hashtag and lots of people use them. And at KinneyQ, I always stress that KinneyQ is by us, for us. And sometimes, in a way, we've suffered because of that, because we haven't merged with other things. We've shown our power to make a difference, our power to be able to bring the first HIV stats data in the UK, where there was none in a high-income country. And we worked hard to bring that. And I, I you know, it's really important that we stay that, whether we live, survive or not, we do that through us and that's so important. And, and I so value you know, Joanne and all the people here um, because the first time I knew about Joanne was from a, a, an article by Walter Brockton. <laughs> and, and, I right. with Walter, and he told me how to get in touch with Joanne and that just made it for me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but thank you for that. And um, yeah, so exactly. And I'm passionate about all trans people being in the HIV response. Being, it's not, as Max said and Joanne said, it's not about, and, and Erica said, it's not about either or, or focus only on. And yes, it, many trans people have been impacted with HIV globally. And that is recognized and must be recognized. And yeah. yet trans men, have a, that issue as well. So, um, and it's not to take away from that focus of trans women and HIV at all. And I don't think it does. Um, I'll keep going on because, you know, I'm not to shut up. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, and <clears throat> yeah, at the moment, you see, I'm really passionate about what we're doing here, like all of us, because yeah. we responded quite quickly to bringing this together, to taking the opportunity. And, you know, it's a global effort. Yeah. And I'm so passionate about our community not yeah. being dismissed, not Definitely. being ignored. 
definitely, Michelle, and that's how we should look at it and we should continue. You know, resilience is the theme for this conference. And as I said before at the beginning, there's no other group that can claim to be the queens and kings of resiliency as transgender people. Um, so, yeah, definitely. So there is a comment uh, on the chat about uh, congratulating us on the work we're doing and being part of Virtual Aids 2020. Very interested in learning how GATE will continue its important work in this era of COVID-19, which poses major challenges to our community. If the panelists will excuse me, I will take that one. <laughs> So, yeah, we're very happy. We have been adapting our programs and our work according to the needs of our community and the people who we work with at the country level. Uh, we are, we ha are a virtual organization, uh, so we have continued our work virtually. Uh, so that didn't change at all. But in regards to the, you know, doing the activism at the global level, uh, trainings, capacity building, knowledge sharing that happens directly with partners at different countries. We have adapted them to meet the needs of the community, uh, extending the deadlines, uh, making sure that there's enough funding for them and for us to meet the objectives and learning and adapting on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think what, what, is the, what is the most important is to listen to our communities, which we will continue to do. So there are several questions, but Max, I want to ask you something. You know, whenever there's uh, meetings and there's funders around HIV and the word trans masculinities or transgender men or non-binary non people come up in that conversation, there's always a hesitation from many people to include uh, uh, transgender people and trans uh, non-binary people in the conversations and they will say there's no evidence that you are at risk. There's mm -hmm. evidence that women who do sex work, transgender women who do sex work are at risk and here are the numbers, they're published by UNAIDS, everybody knows it, we collect the data in the different countries. What would you answer such a person? Um, that like, I mean, I would answer it in, in, Mauro, in Mauro's words from the other day that like uh, absence of data is not like an absence of the problem. You know, it's like the, the, the fact that there is no data, that there is no research on us um, just shows that, you know, that, that if, you not look, if you not look into what's going on, then you don't get any numbers. And, you know, like what's like by us, for us, the, the process is like trans people need to be included. Like they need to be included in order for the researchers to ask the right questions. Because if you come to us with the wrong questions, like if you just like make whatever survey about like, yeah, we do all like include all MSM and then you just talk about anal sex in your survey. I'm like, wait a second, you know, like there is people like trans people or people identifying as like male who do more than anal sex, you know? And if you don't ask these questions, if you don't get that right, you won't get the answers. So if you like, this is, this is, this is a problem. And um, that certainly needs to change that we are being included, that we are being like included from the very first steps of every research process from like starting thinking about the project um, until like disseminating the, the outcomes. And um, that, yeah, well, absence of data does not uh, persist like an absence of the problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I, I really want to thank the people who are taking their time to post the comments and their questions on the chat box. I forgot to thank the previous person. Kennedy, thank you very much. All the way joining us from Belize. Thank you very much. Um, so we have uh, a comment in the, in the Q&A. The, it reads, I wonder if there was an opportunity to perhaps do an international intergenerational project around trans and non-binary HIV and sexual health care in order to generate and strengthen knowledge, but also to take learning from the past into the future of trans and non-binary health care. This looks like a whole thesis to me. It looks so interesting that I want to jump and grab it as a title of, a, of something I want to present next, but I let the panelists answer this. Please go ahead. Well, certainly. <laughs> I, I, I get excited about that as well. I think that, um, you know, that, um, that kind of thinking 
is the kind of thinking that will take us to the next level. Um, but, you know, as Max was uh, pointing out, and I think that, you know, our, um, the, you know, presenting on the history of our participation at the international AIDS conferences uh, reflect, there hasn't been the level of investment in our community in terms of knowledge development and uh, academic, you know, um, research taking place. Um, there's been, you know, a relatively fair amount in the global north, less so in the global south. Um, the distribution of resources for that kind of research has been minimal at best. And, um, you know, research, unfortunately, you know, whether, you know, whether, you know, I like it or not, research is an expensive endeavor. Um, and so, uh, and particularly international research, um, it doesn't come inexpensively. And particularly if you want your research to be validated and to be recognized by academic, um, you know, um, 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 publications and journals, um, you must have, you know, uh, valid research methods, methodology and approaches. Otherwise, you won't be taken seriously. Um, anything that is not, you know, uh, valid and generalizable, you know, as far as uh, journals are concerned, is anecdotal in evidence. Yeah. Um, and they don't take it seriously. And so in order to actually do the kind of research that um, the, the attendee is, is asking about, we really need the kind of investment that would make it possible uh, in order to have uphold rigorous uh, you know, research uh, data collection uh, approaches and to have the research validated and generalizable across countries. That would, you know, that's the gold standard, actually. Um, but I personally, you know, having worked in this field for as many years as I have, have never seen those kinds of resources made available to us as trans researchers, of which, by the way, there are only a handful in the world uh, trans people involved in the specific field of research. Um, and so, you know, it's a very growing uh, number, huh? It's a very growing number, you know. It, uh, it is a growing number, but you know, researchers com comparatively speaking, if you compare yeah. the number of researchers yeah. in our community to others, it's, but we exist, know. we exist, and people just need to make the work yeah. like to do their work right to find us, to come and find us, and to talk to us. And if you can't find them, go to the next organization, they will point out the right people. You know, that's the... Yeah. Like, the problem, Max, I'll, I'll tell you what the problem is, is that, you know, it, it's, again, it's by us, for us. So if we want really the, for the research questions to be valid and to be significant and relevant to us, then we have to train the next generation of researchers from within our own community who then understand what, we, what it is that we're going through and how, how to approach us. Because as long as we depend on cis people, you know, not cis non-trans people, yeah. you know, who, to do this work, you know, then we are at a disadvantage because they're approaching us in ways that make sense to them, not ways that make sense to us. No. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michelle. Very yeah. short, and then we will proceed with the last. Okay, question. very short. Um, yeah, I, I, I get sent, like maybe other people do, uh, requests for research saying they're doing their PhD and everything. And I, I just, I review what they're sending me and I ask them, what connection have you got with the trans community? You know, oh no, well, this is a good idea. I thought it might be useful. I, I don't have much connection at all with the trans community. And I'm sorry, this is my truth. I just go, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I don't tell them why I can't help them. I just say no. But if it's trans-led, if it's trans-focused, and also, <clears throat> I want, I'm a service provider, I have been for many, many years. I want research that's gonna inform practice, 
that's going to inform take services that further, that's going to inform areas that there is no research, that there is no research that backs up practice, good practice, ethical yeah. practice for trans people. That's the kind of research that I like to see, and I mm -hmm. will help with that, but, uh, yeah. mainly if it's by trans people or trans people in uh, um, oh. partners in it. Yeah. You know. Very good. So we're going to go, uh, we have 10 minutes left and we have several comments. So uh, we have a comment, uh, a person saying com they're glad to join the webinar. Um, Michelle invited them and agrees with the by us for us. Trans people deserve to occupy places that have been denied before. We need to be leaders to guide younger generations. Thanks all for your hard work. Much love, Victoria. So that's a very good feedback. And uh, Will Beckham, I just peer reviewed the paper on PrEP Cascade among trans MSM. The work is started at least in the US. Congratulations, we welcome that. Next time we're gonna have you as a panelist here. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for all your work. Um, and this is something perhaps all of you can address a little bit. Uh, Millie from Guyana welcomes the Virtual AIDS 2020. However, there are some challenges for trans people to access this space because of the pandemic and social distances. Mm. Few words for Millie. Hang in there, sister. We know how hard it is for you and for many people around the globe to participate yeah. in these virtual spaces. You know, the reality is that um, you know, as much progress as we've made, we have a lot of progress to make in terms of uh, economic equality for our community. And without, um, you know, without resources, without economic equality, we're simply, we don't have the, you know, the equipment, we don't have the, bra the broadband, we don't have the bandwidth, we don't have uh, you know, Wi-Fi, um, you know, we're, we're at uh, the mercy of um, organizations, often non-trans organizations, who make those spaces available for us to participate virtually. Um, it's a challenge. And, uh, you know, it's a challenge that, you know, I don't have the answers for. Um, but nevertheless, it's a challenge. And uh, I hope to see in my lifetime, um, you know, uh, a time when uh, the econ economic opportunities for trans people have changed that, um, that reality and that trans people won't be challenged by participation in, in spaces where other people readily do. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you very much. Just also to note that uh, uh, there's a lot of things happening in the main conference, but there's tons of very, very good things happening at the Global Village. The Global, uh, the Global Village, once again, I say is access, free of access for everyone. It has open access, but so we hope to see you there. Um, Alexandra Rodriguez, yes, you can, we can see your message. You can continue. Um, uh, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand or ask, uh, put it there on the Q&A section and we will give you the microphone. We have a few minutes left uh, for this. And uh, uh, thanking all the panelists for your passion, your humility and your words, sending love. We need to get a place at the table of the finance provider. Thanks again. Uh, and Millie, thank you, Joanne, for the encouragement that you have provided. So with this, I'm gonna go one uh, comment from everybody, your final words. Um, well, the song Keep On Trucking has been going through my head, you know. <laughs> so I think those are the words I'm going to leave you with, you know, keep on trucking. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get there um, together. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm reminded of the words you were saying about trans people being resilient. And I think it's kind of what we have to be. And I know some people don't always feel that. And that's 
we're here to support people in that. But it's so important. And there have been changes in my lifetime. So if we don't acknowledge those changes, then it feels like we're only standing still. But we have to keep more going on. And this thriving in diversity, I think our community is so diverse. I just love that. And I embrace it. Thank you, Michelle. Max? Yeah, I mean, I, I would second that, absolutely. I mean, like, seeing that we have come together, like, like just at this panel, which is like four different people, four different countries, uh, four different perspectives, and I, I don't even know where all the participants come from, like the attendees um, in this meeting, and like seeing, you know, that, um, as Erica said earlier, for uh, for us as as gay, as like an internationally working group, like these online meetings are not new. But like also the way of like activism has happened over the past years, you know, or like decades, like it happened through the internet, like a lot, and it, it and it grew through the internet, like to get connected. And of yeah. course, it would have been great to come together in this physical space to hug people and to you know like like physically feel each other and feel each other's energies and presence and everything. But it also like I, I I see things are happening and also with the with the conference that we will reach people in different places in different areas with the trans networking zone that is accessible even without attending the conference or having paid for the conference, and I'm hoping that this encourages people to continue fighting and um, because you know we will we will make a change and no matter how big or small the steps are it's going like I'm optimistically going forward. <laughs> Thank you very much, Max. And you know, something that uh, is very unique, uh, trans people, you know, coming from the past where uh, Joanne took us of how little participation, how challenging it was, to now in this conference and hopefully in future conferences, being involved in reviewing abstracts, submitting abstracts, submitting satellites, uh, you reviewing scholarship applications, uh, being part of planning this conference. So I think we, we are getting there more participation. What we need to ensure is that our communities also take hold of the opportunities, um, you know, apply for scholarships when there's the call. And we need to set up systems to help each other so that our communities can actually go through that process of the application because sometimes it's not easy. So this is something that we have taken note that perhaps in the future we can improve um, as organizations here in this panel. So we want to thank you all for your time, for joining us in learning what will happen during AIDS 2020 uh, virtual. And of course you will be able to, uh, be, to follow uh, if you go to Gates website and you will be able to uh, get the updates of the sessions, the times according to your uh, time zone and join us. Remember the programming, the films, the videos, the panels that will be available in the trans networking zone. You can click on them and see them and enjoy them at any moment of your time. Uh, wherever you are. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Joanne. And thank you very much, Navon, for all your support in the background. <laughs>